come through. Um, I've been studying the body for, I don't know, 20 years or so, maybe a bit longer. Um, and uh, working with somatic signals, the way we express ourselves and uh, the depth that we can go so quickly with that is one of my most favorite things in the world to do. So uh, this is kind of a teaser just to kind of get your appetite whetted for this kind of stuff. Um, and hopefully it's enticing to you and helps you see and think about things maybe a little bit differently. So I have some um, slides here for us that I will share. Uh, there we go. Um, so I have been organizing this, these little webinars in kind of a three-part view. Um, so I, I like to use the word somatic signals in contrast to nonverbal communication because the voice and breathing and things that affect the voice are such an important part of understanding what the soma is communicating. And there is a, a fellow named uh, Thomas Hanna, who's really famous um, a couple of decades back for his work with this, with the body. He was a Feldenkrais practitioner first and then um, became a um, uh, his own kind of work. And he said he liked the word soma better than body because soma is a Greek word that means like the living, intelligent body being. So it's goal and goal directed your soma has its own goals it has its own desires it has four billion years of evolution uh, and intelligence that's you know that's there so i really like to use the word soma and i like to think about the ways that the soma signals to us about what it is experiencing which can be different from what the mind is experiencing so we'll be looking at guidelines around uh, working with somatic sim signals. We'll look at um, baseline and context and how they help you make meaning with somatic sig signals. And then we'll talk a little bit about gestures because that's one of the most accessible starting points if you want to work with those kinds of signals with your clients. Um, so this, everybody hopes for this, but I'm sorry to tell you there is no magic lookup table. There's in people who tell you like, this means that, you know, when people cross their legs, it means this, or they, you know, don't believe it. It is really not true. Um, even emblematic gestures like, okay, can mean something quite different in a different culture. So gesture is not a, a one size fits all. It's something that you have to learn to work with and unpack and uh, be skilled at catching and using. It's something that most of us do all the time without even thinking about it. And there's only some gestures that you want to pay attention to when you're working with people. So we will do some exploring about that. Um, I want to just make a, a point, a, a difference between seeing versus observing. Um, and for us to, uh, most of the time we are just seeing, we're really mostly inside of our own experience. And we're sort of filtering and receiving what other people do uh, through that lens of our, our own meaning making and our own context. And uh, observing is different. So one is really a little bit more of a right left hemisphere dance where you have categories, you know that when you're looking at certain kinds of things, they might be useful or meaningful. Um, so you're kind of a little bit less in your own experience, you're a little bit dissociated from your own experience so that you're really kind of objectively watching someone. And so that's what we mean by observing. And you need to be able to do that so that you can sort of objectively identify things. And that's different from what uh, Bert Hellinger talks about is seeing. And seeing is much more of a gestalt uh, open awareness. Um, it's a more associated state. You're more in your own experience. Uh, you're kind of just receptively letting things come to you. It turns out that in working with somatic signals with somebody, you need both of these. You need to be able to be open and receive something, like something catches your attention, it sparks an interest in you, but you also have to be able to make sense of it and have an idea of what to do with what you've seen. So being able to kind of switch between most people, most of us can't hold those two states together at the same time. So being able to kind of drop into like a little more observing mode and then into the more felt sense seeing mode 
Um, that's what usually gets us the most meaningful signals because we're using our whole body, our whole instrument. We're using our ability to go, what was that? You know, is that important? Should I unpack it? Um, along with our own resonance sense of being in relationship with somebody else and feeling their sense, their system and who they are. So we have to kind of be able to have some structure for making use of the signals that people share with us, as well as being able to have that resonant state so we can kind of feel what's going on for them. So it's those two abilities that we want to put together when we're working with somatic signals. So um, I liked I like this image here, so, so lovely, because this woman is obviously telling a story to this little group of children and uh, the soma, the somatic self, is always telling its story. It's telling the story of of who we are, where we've, who we've been with, uh, what we've done with our lives. The soma is really like this um, history of our experience. If you have lived with, uh, if you grew up with a critical parent, you might have a chronically set of rolled shoulders and be breathing shallow. If you have trauma, those markers will be in your body. And usually even after we work them through, they're still a residual. So I like to say that I can see who, what your parents were like. I can see what your family was like. I can see who's important to you. I can see all this from your body. I remember <laughs> um, I was in uh, Burnry doing a training there uh, with the international intensive and a, a woman I was doing the somatic work and she we just stood up about six feet from each other it's what I call somatic imaging and uh, as soon as I took a two steps forward I I knew I was male and I was standing in confrontation with her like I was I immediately was in a con you know I could watch her body respond and my body respond and I said well who, you know who is this person and what's the deal and she was indeed having problems with her husband they were in a standoff at that time. So I could see it in the way she was standing. She had a lot of energy in the front. She was guarded. She had, you know, muscle tension there. So it's not like we don't tell people our stories. We tell people our stories all the time. And the soma will tell the truth. The mind, not so much. But the soma will tell the truth. So if we train ourselves to be observant, to see as well as feel the people that we're with, we will have access to a lot more information, actually too much information. We usually have to kind of damp it down or it floods us. So we've learned, most of us have learned not to see. So beginning to work with somatic signals is learning to see again, but in a different kind of way. So we want to we want to get the stories that the that the soma is telling. The mind is also an important part of this, but we want to start to learn to say where does the soma show me what's going on? Where does the soma soma show me its history, what's happening right now? Uh, you know, and it's going to be things like face. Of course, we're pretty plugged into that, and we have more controls on the face, so face can be also misleading. Things like posture, gesture, breath, and the voice that rides on the breath, the melody of the voice, the prosody, those we have less controls over. So if you know to start to put these together when you're working with somebody, you can get a really good idea of what's going on. How were they raised? What happened in their family? Who's important to them now? What kind of situations they're in? All that information is actually there. So um, the question then is, how do we use it? How do we make use of this? And uh, what's important for us if we're working with somebody, if we're in a, a counseling session or we're in a group or something, and we want to work with a person, we have to begin to see what is the baseline story? What is that Soma's story that is telling pretty much all the time? Um, and that may be, you know, the hunched shoulders and the low, shallow breathing and the tension in the face or, you know, the jaw, for instance, or, you know, that's like that. That's the story about how the person got here. Um, and that's their baseline. And once I kind of figure out what your baseline is, what your vocal range is, what your breathing is, 
um, how you tend to hold yourself, how big your gestures are. You know, if I, you'll see me when I work with people, I'll chat, chat with them. If I haven't seen them before, I'll chat with them for a few minutes. I'm, I'm getting a baseline reading. I'm finding out, okay, what's your normal range of expression? Because the things that are going to be most useful for me are the deviations from that. Whether it's, you know, bigger or smaller, that's what's going to show me where the hot spots are. That's what's going to show me what I need to watch for. And I'm going to be watching things like timing. I'm going to be watching for changes in the baseline. Um, and I'm going to be putting this into a context. Like, are we sitting in a counseling session? Am I sitting at a bus stop? <laughs> right? Those are going to be really different. Or am I trying to tell, you know, working with a coworker and then trying to tell if they're telling me the truth or not? These are three different contexts that are going to make me sort for different information. I'm going to be looking for different things off that baseline. So context is really, really important. For example, if you saw a little girl holding her mama's hand, uh, walking into a church, and she said, is the Pope Catholic? You know, you would have a certain meaning that you make from that. If you overheard two college-age kids who were chatting about the upcoming dance, and one asked the other, are you going to the dance? And the other said, is the Pope Catholic? You would make a different meaning out of that, right? So you would think, oh, yeah, of course I'm going. So it really matters what context this is happening in, because that's a lot of how we make meaning. The other thing that we're looking for is uh, congruence. Is the narrative that I'm being told congruent with the story I'm seeing on the body? And if there's incongruence, there's something for me to pay attention to. So um, if somebody is telling me, for instance, that like if I'm working with a, I'm thinking of actually a client who I'm working with um, a, a year, number of years ago, and I ask her, are you safe at home? And she stops breathing, her shoulders come up, and she shakes her head no and says yes. I'm going to stop, right? I need to pay attention. I need to unpack that. So I'm looking for the context, the congruence, the, you know, is this a, that's a change from her baseline. You know, those are the kinds of things that help me figure out among all the things that this person is showing me, what is important? What do I need to pay attention to? So there's, of course, a lot of lots we could do with this, but we'll just kind of focus in on gesture for this little webinar today. Um, so we're working with gesture, this is where the observer comes in. This is where the having some understanding of how gesture is created and used is helpful for you in terms of picking out what matters. So there's kind of two main types of gesture. One are gestures that accompany speech. They're called co-speech gestures. And there's four different kinds that I'll talk about. And then the other is uh, emblems. And these are like shorthand. Like in our culture, we would say, okay, right? And we can you know, how are you doing? And somebody could just give you that emblem. So it stands in for communication. It's like a substitute for words. These are, of course, culturally determined. Like I say, this could mean something quite different in the, another culture. And it requires that we understand that, that culture in that context. But there's sort of a shorthand. So those, for the most part, are not that interesting to us in our work. We're, at, we're much more interested in the gestures that accompany speech. So... There's kind of four things that are um, useful. One is, um, these are called like iconic, like the big fish that somebody caught to show you the fish. This is useful to us because somebody will say, well, I, I might ask them, how was your family growing up? And they say, well, there was my mom and there was my dad. And all of a sudden I, I have a pretty good sense of how that family worked, right? Because mom is over here and dad is over here and the kid is showing me that they're in the middle. So this is not an, you know, they've, they've literally represented those people with their hands. And that could be a useful gesture to me. Um, people will also use um, pointing. So for instance, if somebody says, you know, we'll say like, you know, I'm, I'm looking over to the, you know, the next, uh, next day and they'll, they'll point to it. They'll actually point to it. This is not usually as useful, but it can be because somebody might say, well, I'm, I'm I'm really looking forward to uh, making this change, but they're they're pointing to something. They're like pointing. They're wrapping themselves up, or they're doing something that's saying, "I'm not right. I'm not making it. I'm not moving forward. I'm moving here." 
right? So we can we can sometimes use pointing as well. Metaphoric is, you know, these can be useful to us too. Somebody would say, well, cross my heart, I'm telling the truth, right? They might use a metaphor like that. Um, and we'd have to have the cultural shared cultural understanding to know what to do with that. And then the final way we use this is people, and this can also be a clue off baseline when somebody starts shaking a finger, they're using beats bup, 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 to emphasize a point. So if somebody's very calm and then all of a sudden they start, you know, moving their body in a rhythmic way or their foot starts moving, that's a <laughs> one to watch for. It's like, oh, there's some activation that wasn't there before. You know, is that useful in the context that I'm seeing it in? So, you know, being able to kind of have a sense of like, what am I seeing when I'm seeing a gesture? Um, how is that being used with the context in the speech? What could that be telling me? Because what I'm going to be looking for are the hot spots. I'm going to be, and we'll talk a little bit more about this. I'm going to be looking for the things that have emotional charge to them, emotional content to them, because at least in my work, that's where the juice is. That's where the change can happen. That's what I want to open up. Um, so I'm going to show you a, a photo. So I want to, but there's, there's tricky parts about this. It can be a little tricky too when we see something. So I'm going to show you a photo and I want you just to notice what pops into your mind. So there's a photo. And just notice what your response was. So just if you just saw that, what would that mean to you if you saw that? What would your first interpretation be? Does somebody want to just unmute and tell me what, what did you go with that? Anyone? Yep, please, Linda. Um, I, I thought sincerity or heartfelt. Mm -hmm. It's close to her heart, so it's something heartfelt. Someone else have a quick interpretation of that one? I saw in-breath. In-breath, that she's inhaling, that she's taking a deep breath, like she's taking a moment to breathe in. Okay. And yeah, I'm not sure whether it's a positive inhaling, what I was seeing. Right, it could be like recovery. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Centering. One more person. Yeah. Centering is what I thought. Centering. Say that again, Tori. Centering. Centering that she's trying to gather herself in. Yes. Right. And so we can see that we are going to interpret. Right. When we're watching other people, we are going to interpret that gesture and you know, oftentimes it, it's, we're fine, it doesn't matter. But when we're trying to work more deeply with people, we have to watch those interpretations, be able to set them aside and inquire. So I might ask, I might, you know, reflect to this woman like, wow, what's what's happening to you right now? I see your hands over your, your chest like this. And she might be saying, I'm just feeling some really deep grief, right? I'm, I'm feeling some deep grief. Or I'm uh, just feeling um, my spiritual faith or, you know, there could be so many things there. So we are going to interpret. The question is, when you see something that is interesting to you, try to open the box. Try to find out what it means to them. So the the um, the thing I would say when I when I need to work with somebody, like if I if this is my client and she was and I were having a conversation and she stops, it's off baseline. And she puts her hands here like this and she takes a moment and her eyes are closed. I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to jump on that one. And I'm going to just say, wow, just take a moment, slow it down. Take a moment. We have to, we gesture so automatically that we're often not aware of what our own soma is telling others, what we're telling the story that we're telling with our bodies. So being able to stop somebody, slow them down and bring their awareness to what they're doing that already is usually deeply meaningful for people, just that somebody is willing to take the time to really attend, to really pay attention to what they are saying with their somatic self. So being able just to say, stop, just leave your hands there, because usually when you say stop, people go, <laughs> so you have to be able to capture that yourself and show them so they can go back there and say, so, well, tell me what that's about. And it could be quite complex. She might say, I'm grieving that I love, left family members. And I'm, you know, at the same time, really loving my faith and loving my, you know, the way that my community works. 
So we want to bring their awareness to their gesture, their awareness to their own physical experience of themselves and what they're saying. And we're always looking for hotspots. Those are the places where people have some really deep feeling. It could be a lot, you know, their voice goes up. It could be above the baseline. It could also be a quiet moment where somebody stops. And I've learned to really pay attention to timing. So it's like how long somebody takes to respond to me. All of these things are really, um, you know, they're just signals that something happened that, that could be useful. So we're looking for those deviations from the baseline that have emotional content that's rel that's related to what the client is actually trying to work with us on. And we, our job is to gently and safely uh, open those doors. So in order for us to do that, and I have made these mistakes. I remember working with one person in a demo um, who's a very esteemed judge in his community, and it was a, just a casual working group. And I just happened to open the door a bit too wide too quickly. And um, the story came out, you know, just in his face, I said, Look, I can see the sadness in your eyes. And, you know, the determination in your jaw. And I'm just curious, what brought you to that point? And he started to break down. And this is a person who doesn't like to do that. right? And he said his mother committed suicide when he was five years old. And that was what I was seeing it was a residual from that. Right. And that was a little bit overwhelming for him. So we have to be really conscious of the context we're in, creating safety, make sure that we're in uh, attunement to the person, um, that we they have to feel us with them in order for them to go into these spaces. We also have to be aware of safety. Like, is this a safe context? Is this like the bus stop? I'm probably not going to go into a somatic signal. Um you know, uh, and do I have permission? Do I do I have their permission? Like this person had volunteered for a demo without really realizing the depth of what I could find in five minutes time. Um, and I didn't set it up well enough to, to give them choice in the matter. So we really want to be uh, attuned, create safety and make sure that we have permission. Um, and, uh, you know, just to give an example where I could see something that I didn't have the permission or safety. I was uh, in a group, just attending a group that was a local group that I was just finding out about um, that was looking at um, suicide survivors. So people who had lost a member of their family to suicide. I don't know why that's up today, but that's the topic that comes to mind. Um, and I saw this woman, they were just sharing who each person had lost. And so she had lost her 16 year old daughter. Um, and the story she told, she, she, her head leaned back, her eyes got really ba big. And she said that she walked in and her daughter had hung herself. And I could tell the daughter was like almost in touching distance. Like that image was still right there in her mind's eye and even affecting the way her body was responding to it. Had I had permission, I could work with that, but it was not a safe place for me to help her with that. For sure, I would have wanted to help shift that image and shift the way her body was responding and the fact that it was still right in front of her it was unresolvable for her so you know people are going to show you things all the time it's not that there's too little information <laughs> there's there's a lot the question is you know do they feel rapport with you do they feel like you're supporting them are you attuned to them are they safe with you and do you actually have permission to open these doors, because I promise you that when you start to work with somatic signals, you will go deep. You know, you will go deep um, because that's where we live. We live in our body experience. So um, being able just to slow it down, bring their awareness to their own Sama, whatever gesture it is that they're making, it helps if you're observing enough that you can replicate, that you can show them because that will quickly take people back to what they're doing. And then finding these hot spots, um, making sure that you have the conditions that allow you to open them in a way that's respectful and safe and you don't take people into places that might be a bit too much um, before they're ready. Um, you know, those, those things make it a very, much, very successful strategy. So um, I know I only have a half hour here, so I'm trying to stay on my time. Um, just a few thoughts. Um, 
I have learned over the years, often, I mean, I've made a number of mistakes where I've stepped over the edge and gone, whoa, I have to dial this back. I have to help this person be safe and recover. And it's nice to have those skills. And it's nice to not have to use that. So what I've learned is taking a client-centered approach is safest if I'm really letting the client lead and having it be about them and meaning making for them um, and and letting go of my own agenda, not having an outcome for myself, uh, that that generally keeps us in safer territory because they are kind of driving the bus. And finally, whatever they come up with, you know, it's their meaning making process that matters. You know, it, it, whatever this was meaning, the hands crossed over the heart to that person. It's their lived experience. It's their world. It's so easy in this field to actually sort of without even intending, put your meaning on somebody. If you're making statements instead of asking questions um, and people aren't used to exploring that level of their feelings and that level of their own uh, lived experience, we can very easily um, skew things so that it works for us maybe but isn't the truth for them the other thing that happens for us is people will show us things that are really close to our own wounds or really close to our own tender spots and being aware of that what your vulnerabilities are i think is a really important requirement for working with people because you know it's it's really tempting to kind of skew their meaning so that you're comfortable and we need to be really kind of courageous and be willing to um, jump in and um, go someplace that we may not be completely comfortable if it's in service of our clients. So keeping ourselves resourced is um, really a key. And I just am um, thinking of the song Respect, you know, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Like that really needs to be the foundation of everything we do when we're working with the body because it is so central to our own experience of ourselves. So being really respectful and kind, being gentle. Um, at the same time, being uh, a little bit like, uh, Arnie Mandel was one of my teachers and he would talk about catching fish. Like if you're, you know, the, the Native American people would put their hands in the water and wait till the fish came by and then be ready to grab it. That's also true with somatic signals. You have to like be really patient and ready. And then when it comes, grab, be ready to pounce and grab the fish with respect. So, and this is just kind of a teaser on uh, working with somatic signals. It's an incredibly rich um, area. I have a little course coming up, um, six session online course starting February 10th. That's all about this, um, all the different ways you can do that. Um, I find that it is it really enhanced the effectiveness of my work and also uh, really added to my client's trust um, when I'm respectful and careful and see all that they're showing me, see all that they're telling me. Uh, it seems to be uh, really helpful for doing deep work. I have uh, for the last time teaching two courses. So if you want to study with me, I'm teaching uh, the organizational course starts on the 27th and I'm teaching my um, systemic family constellation facilitation course starting on the February 3rd. Uh, and then I won't be doing those two again. So um, I would love to open the space for questions or comments. Uh, if you have some questions or comments, there's lots I could share on this. I'd be happy to uh, make some space for that. Yeah, just what stands out for you. Any thoughts on this? Anyone? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I've been working with somatic, uh, visceral somatic quieting of the inside of the body mm -hmm. in another modality, and this sounds very similar. However, I find it very interesting that you're bringing in the aspect of the body language, mm -hmm. you know, reading the people, which is not something that I've learned in other modalities. Mm -hmm. so I find this very intriguing. Mm -hmm. uh, the family constellation that you teach um, is something I've experienced. I've went to you and I've been a person. I've been involved in that. There's recently been a, a show on Netflix called, oh, oh, I'm trying to remember, 
but he does those constellations. Mm. Another self. What was Another it? Self. Another, Another self. self. Okay, great. Another self. Yes. And that's what mm -hmm. keyed me in. And then the next day I got your email and went, oh, mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm very intrigued after watching those three part series. It's just three mm -hmm. series, mm -hmm. 45 minutes each. Right. But yeah. So you will see people. I mean, it's almost like a screen, the body, like a video screen, you know, it's like, you'll see the mother come in, you'll see the, you know, the, you'll see the whole family displayed in certain ways, as you start to talk about these things with people. Um, so it's, yeah, you'll hear the mother's voice, you know, you'll just we we are not quite this monolithic self, we are more like a collage of a kaleidoscope of selves, things that we've learned and responded to uh, physically over time. So it's, you can gain a whole lot of information. So we're really, I'm not trying to quiet the body, I'm trying to listen, and let it tell me its story, and help my clients become aware of the story that they're telling. Because, you know, <laughs> as members of families, we're often sworn to keep family secrets or we're, you know, we have to keep the family line going, but the Soma tells a different story. And that's what's so wonderful about constellation work is, you know, we're using somatic knowledge to create placements and pictures and images of family structures. So we're getting a different story than the party line that you may have had to keep as a member of your family, right? We're, we're getting a more honest story in many ways. Yeah. So that's what, that's the beauty of the work and power of it. Yeah. So thanks, Tori. Yeah. Anyone else comments, questions? That's Linda. And then. Um, are you going to send us an email with that link? I couldn't copy it off the screen for the um somatic signals workshop yes. yeah. sessions okay if you're signed up you'll get the link yeah okay yeah. great oh, thanks yeah and then uh julia yeah really helpful what you were saying at the end about the it's the client's story interpretation mm -hmm. it's how they are taking it mm -hmm. at the pace i've been working with a client who wasn't even able to speak about their parents mm. even mention them right. their biological parents wow. until i thought i'm wasting this person's life <laughs> and more money yet mm. it was exactly the right pace by mm. my just like you say letting go off the agenda of what i need to do as the therapist right um and she's done she's done what for her were huge steps Mm -hmm. which to me felt like I'm not doing enough right <laughs> yeah then the inner critic comes in for us right <laughs> yeah they always look on for us right yeah so I think one of the things that's helpful about this approach is that you when you're really pacing off the client um, and using them as your measuring stick if you will um, it can kind of soothe that inner critic that's saying, I should be more productive, I should do, you know, because you can and, see. And had I gone in faster with, with the somatic gestures that I was seeing, mm -hmm. she would have been totally unsafe. Right. Yeah. I yeah. I think so. It's, it's good to hear that, actually. Yeah. Safety and permission are keys. Is mm. when, we, when we step over that, and I have done it, um, that's when we get in trouble. Mm. Yeah, then it's, it's not so good. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Anyone else? Is, is it? Say your name for me, Ace. Ace. Aisha. Aisha. Okay. Yeah. Oh, actually, I have a question. Mm. What if the info we get from the gestures overwhelms us? Mm -hmm. How we going to distinguish the important ones to uh -huh. follow what to so, choose so here's something that you may not want me to say to hear but i'm gonna say it because it's true you need to dissociate a little bit mm -hmm. if you're if you're so much in resonance you actually don't have enough uh observer and perceptive space to be able to sort what you're seeing so really um as much as we like the feels right uh, me too i love the feels right some it's there's a balance of like feeling and then coming out and watching and being mm -hmm. able to kind of like 
then I can see which things are really standing out um, and which things are, are, you know, really just part of her normal speech. So it is being, it is this dance of like being in and out. And, you know, the real masters like Arnie Mindell and Bert, you know, they can kind of do both at once, right? Most of us have to kind of work it back and forth until we kind of get the rhythm and then we can, you know, keep it going. But we sometimes we're over associated. We're actually too deep in resonance with somebody. We're too much in their world to keep an us separate that can actually have the discernment to help them. Mm -hmm. So there's a balance point there, you know, of like being a little bit out so you can watch, right? And then you'll then you'll see pattern. Then you'll start to go, oh, that's baseline. That's baseline. Ooh, what was that? Right. Ah, that's something that's now I can dive back into that associated state, right? And feel mm -hmm. with that. Uh, so the, it's a skill, really. Mm -hmm. It's a skill. It's a learnable skill, right? Mm -hmm. So even people like Arnie, who's a master at this, you know, he's got a he took steps to get there. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, most of us get into this work because we love the feels. Right. Um, but that doesn't always leave us in the most useful place for our clients. So, you know, developing all of our muscles is kind of um, what what gives us the breadth uh, mm -hmm. to be able to, to help them navigate through places where they can get stuck. So I hope that was useful. Some people always say, but I like the feels. <laughs> I know, me too. <laughs> I'm making a gesture and I say thank you. Right, yeah, I got it. It's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, yes, of course. Thank you. Yeah, Mary Frances, anything you want to add as we wrap up today? Okay. Well, I hope to see some of you in the little uh, six session course. And if not, I hope your curiosity is tweaked and you're going to start watching and listening and uh, observing people a bit differently. So thank you for giving me your half hour. and. I wish you well. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.